jumped from the 26th floor and died on 26th Street of his um, apartment. And then the other one is, uh, his name's Harry, let's see, Vasu, I think. And he was only 25 years old and he jumped out of Presbyterian, New York's uh, Presbyterian Hospital a few days later. And I lost both men I dated in med school to suicide, not during medical school, but later. And, um, and here, here they are. And so this is like a really big problem. And that's why I, I'm obsessed and I can't get off of this topic until we address it in a serious way because it does deserve serious attention. And I really wish that I could interview these people who just died, but of course I can't. And um, I, I just would love to know what their chief complaint is, you know? Um, I, since they're dead, I sort of feel compelled to do an autopsy on myself, a psychological autopsy on the mind of a medical student. So this is not that easy to do, but I did dig up all my, um, my the diary I kept during medical school 25 or so years ago. My, um, my yearbook, you know, I have my assignments here, I have letters, I have, you know, to, I had to read through all this. And, and, and I put it off for a long time because I didn't want to read it because it was really painful to be there. So I really didn't want to have to dig through it. But since I want to know what's happening with these people who are dying, I just decided to, you know, dive into some pretty heavy material. and. Um, and what I discovered, it was pretty horrifying, some of the things I read, but, you know, there were some interesting surprises now, you know, 20, 25 years into the future to kind of look at this with the wisdom that I have now. So first of all, I would say, um, like most medical students, I started first year really happy and excited and that I was finally getting my dream off the ground. And, you know, I was excited about everything. I was excited about my apartment. I was excited about my new puppy. I was excited to hear men's voices, even with this Texas twang, because I was at this uppity East Coast all women's college for four years, so I hadn't really been around men for a while. So, like, the whole thing was new and interesting and exciting, and I was, you know, even excited to get B's and C's in my classes on tests because I thought that's still pretty good being in medical school to, to you know, I wasn't getting straight A's anymore. I was fine with all of that. And then two months into my first first year of medical school, I got extremely depressed, which continued uh, like for the next two years and it was horrible. And it, I was like, I was crying every night. I, I did tell my parents because I thought they could help me because they're physicians. So obviously they went through this before, but they really useless. Uh, you know, honestly, there was nothing they could do to help me. My mom did send me some antidepressant sleeping pills, which didn't help. And so like, I was just kind of alone in my apartment crying with my dog feeling miserable and I just felt like my soul was dying it was the worst feeling ever and um, and it wasn't because of academics it was because of the culture of medicine it just absolutely made me sick and um, and 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 it's it was just really strange because um, it was it was just I was so alone and I had to figure out what to do all by myself. Um, nobody else in my class seemed to be uh, so depressed. I, you know, between, between episodes of crying, like I did start to develop this extreme perfectionism about my personal life, which was new for me. Like even though uh, nobody in my town was recycling that I knew of, I started recycling everything. I had everything like completely organized, even though I had nowhere to take it. I didn't own a car. I was recycling everything. I didn't want anything to go in the trash. I started becoming, I was a strict vegan. I was like taking in stray animals. I was trying to, I, 
it today it dawned on me like why I did this. I think it's because I saw so much unethical behavior in my medical school that was so hypocritical that like I just on the other end went like extremely ethical perfectionist like to somehow counteract what I was seeing which I thought was um, just undermining like the human spirit and I did not want my soul to die so I was just like on top of it every day doing everything I could and um, and then I even wrote in my diary um, I will not consent directly or indirectly to participation in any abusive system in order to achieve my vision I must be strong I must adhere to what is good in all caps and walk away from what is wrong and I just had to constantly between crying episodes like keep reminding myself of what I was trying to do in my life because I felt like everything was trying to crush me and um, and so um, so then what really threw me off and I had no idea it was coming is uh, these dog labs that we had to do in my school so that was um, you know reading in the uh, instructions of what was coming next towards me that was four students assigned to each dog in a, an events of the cardiac cycle lab where uh, we had to inject into a live dog epinephrine and then study the EKG the dog was probably already stressed out but whatever study the EKG which probably doesn't look too good and then um, cut the cardiac nerves slice open their chest shock their heart like give them a heart attack really a dog and then cut their heart out and take our scissor blade and stick it in the aorta and slice it down into the ventricle and check to see if they had heartworms and then throw their body in a dispose of the carcass, and then clean your instruments and your workstation. And so there was just no way, I was like ethical vegan, you know, I, there was no way I was gonna sit and kill a dog to try to become a doctor. It just didn't make any sense at all. So I, um, but I was, I, I just, oh, I kind of just lost it. So I went and signed the papers to drop out of medical school because I just couldn't take it. It was just way like over the top, okay? And then I um, realized after I signed the papers that I didn't have any money to get a U-Haul because I spent it all on my tuition and my Apartment. So it's not like I could go anywhere. So then I had dropped out of medical school, but I was stuck at my medical school, like at the same time, sitting on this bench outside the library when my anatomy partner walked by, who's really like a super common sense type of guy. And I explained my, my predicament and he said, well, why don't you just keep taking tests and see what happens? which I obviously took his advice and then graduated. So, um, but, I, but I, I still had to figure out what to do about this dog lab because I wasn't gonna do it. So I think it just dawned on me driving here. Oh, that was like, for me, the, the, um, like the moment of my life of fight or flight. Okay, that was the fight or flight. Like I was trying to flight and it did not work. So then I just went into complete fight mode, which, I'm usually a really agreeable, nice person, and uh, but at this moment, I called the actual uh, chairman of the physiology department. Oh, I, I wrote him a letter. I said, I am not going to be doing, just FYI, I'm not going to be doing this animal lab. And he wrote me right back <laughs> and said, uh, I told him I wasn't going to do these animal experiments, and he said that uh, these experiences are not experimental that attendance is mandatory and there is no alternative to these experiences. I mean, what, what could they give me that's an alternative to that? It's pretty barbaric. Um, and you have been placed on team 11B, he told me when I have to show up and a failure to participate in this experience will compromise the learning experience for your fellow teammates and will be an unexcused absence and result in your um, getting an incomplete grade, which, will, which is required in order to matriculate into the 
clinical core. So he pretty much said I was screwed. So I just, um, interesting, there, I didn't read you the whole letter, but there was a part in here that said, like, if you had objections to, participate, to participation in this laboratory, you should have petitioned the dean of medicine. And so I think, like, and I, this is what I totally got, like, rereading this 25 years later. I really got hung up on that word petition because I literally got out a petition and started circulating it around my class, which said, um, we the undersigned feel that labs involving the use of live animals are unnecessary or unjustified due to our moral beliefs. We therefore ask that we be exempted from or offered an alternative to these labs in our medical school education. And there's 189 students in my class and um, a total of four people signed it. So that's the situation I was in, that four people thought that it was wrong to do that. And uh, quick math, 185 people thought that was okay. That kind of pissed me off, but I was glad I got four people, you know, me being one of them. Um, so I got three other people besides me who thought that there was something wrong with this. Um, but I was still in this like massive high adrenaline fight mode. And so, which is kind of interesting for a 22 year old to go against her entire medical school and all these guys that are in their 50s and 60s and mahogany offices who don't have to do anything you say. They could just kick you out and replace you with somebody else. So it's not like I'm in the driver's seat or anything, but I sort of acted like I was and it was effective. Um, so I, Actually, I, I, I created another petition, which was essentially like, I support my classmates' right to choose based on their religious and philosophical um, you know, beliefs not to participate in these labs. And I circulated that all around, and I got zero people to sign. Oh, that sucks, you know? Okay, so I threw that one away. I can't even find it. I just didn't save my blank petition. But I did mail this one to the Dean of Medicine, George Bryan, who, um, who basically made me meet with him and he diagnosed me in his big office there. He, I, I, was, I was just, I was so mad. I mean, it was hard for me to have any kind of empathy for anyone that was trying to do this to me. But um, reading this stuff later, it's kind of interesting. I, I think he was like a nice guy, but I just was so worked up that he, um, he did, he, he, I think he thought I was interesting too, um, but he diagnosed me with Bambi syndrome and he, um, he uh, basically exempted me from doing all these live animal experiments, which there were more than just the dogs. There was the hypovolemia experience and the, and the sheep and the, all the other stuff that we had to do to, where they reuse animals every year who were completely freaked out being around humans because of the, it's just unbelievable. But anyway, so I didn't have to do it. That's awesome. I, um, I, uh, uh -oh, I lost my place. I didn't have to do it. And so then I, um, I really went out on a limb. At that point, I just, I still must have been in fight mode because I wrote this amazing anti-vivisection piece that I submitted to the city paper and they printed it in the op-ed section, which is super bold for a first year medical student to just go out into the public and basically say that all this stuff is wrong and have it printed in the paper. So yeah, I'm giving you copies of all this when you leave because I, I'm like, I like to encourage everyone to stand up for themselves. Like the sooner we do it, the better our profession's gonna be. And so then I, um, I actually, every year, and I do recommend this for medical students, every year I kind of wrote a little summary of kind of how I did in medical school and I did a mass mailing to all my friends, which is pretty easy now with the internet, but I actually type, wrote stuff with a typewriter and um, put them in envelopes and everything and just so, every, just so I, people could keep informed with my life. And so here's what I wrote about my first year in medical school. I put, this is just a portion incomprehensible to me it seems the majority of people condone the use of live dogs for first-year medical students to carve on with absolutely no surgical skills and little idea of what they are doing and how it fits into the greater scheme of things with their hearts cut out and blood on their hands and the 50 carcasses and tidy plastic bags another class of medical students is on its way to becoming the healers of our society 
Why are the screams of the helpless and powerless animals unheard by the students? What implication does this have for the helpless and powerless in society seeking health care? And why is life taken so lightly? These are the basic questions I continue to ponder. If nothing more, this year has taught me about human nature, the difficult fight against power structures and institutionalized systems, and most importantly, how to be consistent and strong in my beliefs, which I highly recommend for everyone, even though it's hard and it's scary. Um, so then, uh, I did still have to be in the building while everyone in my class did these dog labs and I didn't even quite get that until I was like in histology and all these dogs with their wagging tails like went by the door and then I was like, I literally was panicking and tunnel vision and heart rate, it was hard. I went into like a panic attack because in the next room, like right on the other side of the wall where I'm like studying histology, like my classmates are being, in my opinion, like methodically dehumanized right in front of me. And it was just super out of body experience, painful. Um, and of course, like, you know, m my classmates came out covered in blood and, you know, yeah, they removed the dog's heart and they also removed theirs and it was just really weird because now these are all my classmates who are somewhat heartless now having had that experience which was there was no alternative to so um, so I uh, I then started noticing that people were in in first and second year were starting to kind of crack like the, that like a guy got arrested for masturbating in the parking lot of a grocery store like okay like a woman in my class raided her parents bank account and ran off to Mexico and like two people killed themselves the year ahead of me in a drunk driving accident off the seawall into the ocean um, and and uh, and a guy in my class got in trouble with the police for pedophilia like I mean it was like everywhere I turned after that I just started seeing people crack like completely open and just lose it you know because it's not normal what they ask us to do like I, we all have a cracking point Mine must be somewhat higher. But anyway, um, this is not the way to train doctors. And so I I'm always hopeful that it's better now. I think it is. They still kill pigs at OHSU for first year medical students. Um, I don't know what they do here. Uh, hopefully none of that. So so anyway, I, um, I, I basically, Oh, the other thing about my school, we have fraternities at my medical school, and I went to an all-women's college with, like, I wasn't really around men. I don't know. Everyone's, like, drinking, running around naked, jumping through fire hoops. They're driving around in a car that says, trust me, I'm a doctor. Oh, my gosh. It was really, like, a combination of the worst juvenile behavior and scary, like, I mean, this stuff, I just couldn't believe what's happening. Um, so, but the good news is, then I started third year, and it was awesome. Third year is great because it's it's like you're finally with patients, which is why you did all this, right? So I just loved third year. Every time I was with a patient, like my personal pain just melted away because I just got lost in their pain, which was so much better than focusing on all my problems. And, uh, and I realized reading through my diaries, like all the trauma that I experienced came at the hands of my classmates and my instructors. Like I did not experience any trauma with patients. Those were like the good times watching people die and inserting chest tubes and that was great it was like all the rest of the time when I'm around these people who have been dehumanized and aren't responding normally like uh, with the normal degree of empathy they had before medical school and it's just not a really good environment so um, so I'm gonna read you two things that I found uh, in my third year portion of my diary so one is called uh, let's see the the uh, <clears throat> That's one of my old lady glasses. One of them is uh, from October 21st, 1991. 
In the morning, I found my cat killed by a car. When I arrived late for pediatric hematology, I was unsure whether my excuse would be well taken. Dr. Oblender said I could take five minutes to pull myself together, which was unexpected considering I've had to listen to her make comments in the recent past about a cat not being any flatter after being run over more than once when a point is redundant. We all went to see a patient with acute lymphocytic leukemia, and she proceeded to tell a story about a cat which I thought was a little strange and insensitive. In conference that afternoon, a doctor came in saying, want to see the control? And a soft white baby bunny was in her hand with a number three written on its back. I hesitated to touch her. I had her in my hands. I hoped she could feel my love while the doctor spoke nonchalantly about whether maternal deprivation should be part of the experiment. And it's a hell that never ends. And this is just what I had to deal with every day. These people, and it's like, if we haven't figured out by 1991 that like maternal deprivation isn't a good idea, you know, and that depriving medical students of emotions isn't a good idea, like, but we have to take little bunny, it's just, I could go on and on. And then I found the, um, the page in my diary for which I was avoiding reading my diary for 25 years. This is the one thing that I did not want to read again, and I found it. And so I wasn't originally going to read it to you, but I think I'm just going to go out on a limb and read it out loud. These are notes that I took during a surgery grand rounds. Good morning, Pamela. Pull x-ray on Mr. Johnson. Take sutures out of Ortiz. And our animals are returned to their metabolic cages. The animal awakens, shivers, and spreads the agent, and is sacrificed anywhere from 7 to 21 days. It's May 6, 1992. Surgery grand rounds, and I can't turn off the voices. I'm required to be here. But I will not view the slides. Stare at the wall, the floor, anything. Melt away, fly away. Another attempt to escape. I was like literally sitting in the back of the room crying, like trying to figure out how to make it through this grand rounds. And another attempt to escape the pain I have known for three years. It's so deep. The Shriners Burn Center was right next to us where they burn animals with, with like without anesthesia, like and they do it all the time. And in my apartment, I had to think about all the animals and all the things that were going on that were just horrendous crimes against sentient beings everywhere around me. It was like super hard to sleep. That's why I don't know if I mentioned earlier that I cried so much that I couldn't my eyelids were sealed shut in the morning and sometimes I couldn't go to class because I couldn't even open my eyes and I had to feel my way to the bathroom is how horrible this was for me. And you know, you might not share my views on vivisection, but I'm sure you have ethical, moral stances on issues. And according to studies, most medical students are, are put into situations where they're having to participate in things that are unethical for them, but they somehow succumb to doing it to get their degree. But it only gets worse if you don't stand up for yourself. Anyway, another attempt to escape the pain I have known for three years. It's so deep, the image is imprinted on my soul. Flashbacks, the dog laps, sure, I still see their tails wagging. The sheep blurred in my vision from my tears. Once we characterize the wound healing in small animals, we can move to large animals. In the middle of an auditorium so large and gaudy like a five-star hotel surrounded by death, where does the money come from? I said to Glenn, who must have been this poor student sitting next to me, had to hear me processing all this. Makes me feel as if there are no social problems beyond these buildings, bordering on ludicrous. He assured me it's for a good cause. Humane research, only when it's necessary. Fuck you. But then the diabetic mouse, don't look at the screen. Out of my left eye, I see the pretty white fur, blood-soaked. One of God's own, Pamela, feel it. Know their pain, protect yourself, be strong. You can't cry here, they don't understand you. Added exothendotoxin to the model. Nude rat, a thymic, a splemic, a genetic clone, patented. Those motherfuckers, I hate them. Wait, I can't do that, I have to love my fellow man. The sheep model is good because we can get large skin flaps, you can look at nerve division. I have to love of them. How? Oh, have a nice day. Take a deep breath, Pamela. Okay, fine. I'm in a room of cadavers, physiologically living, spiritually and emotionally dead, trapped in some sort of wealthy medical complex in Texas. So, like, these are the kind of notes I was taking in class. It was like, 
very out of body weird. Okay. And I have to get a lot of therapy after medical school to heal from this. I'm hoping you guys don't have to experience the trauma that I did. Um, but anyway, I uh, then entered fourth year, which was awesome. Again, fourth year is like the home stretch. It's like you can see that like you can't be stopped. And so it was, it was really wonderful. And, and a really cool thing happened about a month before I graduated, I realized that I had a secret admirer in administration. And I didn't really know this actually until sitting in Denny's two nights ago at 4 a.m. when I had the willpower to sit and read through all this. But what happened is that in my third and fourth year, because I love patients, I, I just, I was writing their stories, kind of like the precursor to pet goats and pat smears. I just thought people had such cool life stories and I wanted to remember them. So I started journaling those, which was much better than writing about the thing that I just read you. And so some of them actually got published, like in the student, um, we have a student magazine at our school. And so like this house call that I did to the Mathis family, they published it. And then I got, I, I got wind of this memorandum that came that came by and uh, it was written by my secret admirer's secretary guess who my secret admirer was the dean of the medical school who let me out of the animal labs which I did not figure this out literally till yesterday but he I'm reading this it says attached find a copy of an article from a recent edition of Omni the publication of the Student Government Association Dr. Bryan has suggested that your office might be interested in interviewing the medical student who wrote this piece since it shows that our medical students do more than just go to school he would really like to have this highlighted in some manner particularly since she will soon graduate so the this huge spread on me in the in the paper uh, right around the time I graduated which was like awesome that's called medical students do more than simply attend classes so yeah anyway so my medical school situation it was a lot of ups and downs I wanted to share with you like my trajectory because I think somehow since I can't interview the people who aren't here I somehow think other people have the same trajectory of being really happy and then maybe getting depressed and then bouncing back. I do know this when people with patients, they have said that their own problems melt away and that's the only time they feel joy. So I'm just sharing this with you because I think it's what you can possibly expect, except hopefully better because this is 25 years ago and I, I'm hopeful that things have changed. Although very weirdly, yesterday I got an email from a friend of mine who said, isn't this your medical school? And it was like a Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine email um, about how they're still trying to get them to remove live animals now from advanced trauma life support at my medical school. My medical school is now using goats. They're using goats for advanced trauma, which I then got the opportunity yesterday to write a letter and remind them, I graduated like 20 years ago. I got exempted from live animal labs. You guys are still using live animals. I'm just writing to respectfully ask you to consider using computer simulation or other sorts of things because like, I think we've come a long way in 20 years and I'm a really good doctor and I didn't go through these experiences that are mandatory and add all that in there so so anyway the the great summary here is I have a top 10 tips for loving medical school and I want you guys to know right now what you can do so that you can avoid some of these pitfalls and I have handouts that you can take with you that include all my letters and a lot of the things that I quoted uh, because I think it's important for you to see that it is possible for you to stand up for yourself and not be afraid and actually have I think you have people that will be secretly rooting for you and like overtly rooting for you if you stand up for what you believe in and so think of what our profession could be if everyone did that it would just be awesome like healthcare, we, we wouldn't need all this legislation to protect us from our patients and all this adversarial relationships that have developed and all these doctors jumping off of buildings. I just don't think it would be happening, you know? So my top 10 tips for loving medical school is first, live your dreams fearlessly. Be the doctor that you always imagined, like right now. Like don't even wait to get your degree, just be that person now. And plaster your personal statement everywhere, like all over your house, in your car, on your computer, I don't know, put it in public bathrooms. Like really let everyone know what your plans are, including like share it with your colleagues because they can keep you accountable to your plans. So you don't wanna just send in your personal statement and then never think about it again and then you graduate. You want everyone to know what your cool plans are, which should be really big and awesome.
right? And then um, number two is cry freely, like show your emotions. It's really when you stop crying that you die. So crying more is better. Like that's what saved me, I think, is just this constant, I had to keep rinsing this stuff off that I was seeing every day. And then three, reach out and ask for help of your colleagues and also provide help. Don't let classmates isolate themselves and withdraw. Start a buddy system. Go look for classmates that you have never met, which is what Rhonda Elkin said she wishes somebody would have done with her daughter because her daughter was kind of like a loner. She wrote a whole book about her beautiful daughter Daughter, the, one of the guys who also jumped off the building was a valedictorian. I mean, these people are amazing. They're killing themselves. But like, if somebody would have just gone to their apartment and checked on them and just been their friends so they wouldn't be all alone because we're like deep thinkers and we're empaths and we're sensitive and it's hard to be put through some of this coursework that we have to do. And hopefully it's better for you than it was for me. But still, I, I just think having at least one friend in your class and it does protect you if you're married, like some of you are married with kids because you automatically can burden your spouse with your problems. But <laughs> no, what you want to do is like really uh, look for that person in your class that you don't know yet and hang out with them and ask them out to tea. And we should have a zero tolerance for abuse and bullying and hazing and being mean. Like, haven't we, like, come on, human evolution. Aren't we like beyond that yet? And stand up for your classmates. When your classmates are berated and made fun of or an instructor is acting in a way that's hurtful to somebody, like stand up and say something. Like go to the classmate and say that was wrong. Write a letter to somebody. Like everyone in here wrote a letter after your exam tomorrow about something that you don't like that's going on in your medical school. Like you could change things for the rest of the year and for people behind you. Wouldn't have to experience the same mean professor. Maybe he could go to therapy and get like healed or something or have an exorcism like really like <laughs> there's got to be a way to help these people but you should not let them pass on this mean bullying stuff to the next generation and so um, you know if you dislike something so the thing is if you can stand up for your classmates who are being abused and for yourself who's being abused you're going to be much better at standing up for vulnerable patients who are poor who come into the ER who get treated like crap and they don't they, and it's like you're, why because like the empathy burnout happened at the dog labs and so we've got to like stand up for each other and be for real and not like allow cruelty to be going on anywhere if you're like you're a healer you're here to heal you have to start with yourself and not let them make you do things that are unethical and not be afraid to stand up and say that's against my religion or I'm not going to do that and don't let them hurt like your classmates so that later on you will not end up hurting patients or animals or anyone else who's depending on you to be a good steward on this planet. And number five is if you dislike something, change it. And I really would like to ask you all to write at least one letter, this term, someone uh, to, to someone that could change something somewhere to improve your life and people who come after you. It could be to somebody in your medical school. It could be, you know, to a family member. I don't know. So. Um, and I love this. Don't ask what your medical school will do for you. What will you do for your medical school? <laughs> you know, really, it is up to you to create the learning environment that you want. And um, I think it's really important to write your heart out just because it's free. Like, you don't have to go to a therapist. You can just, like, writing these stories was so helpful for me. And all my patients who are in the book are like, I'm in the book. They're so excited because somebody thought they were important enough to write a story about, even if you use, like, a different name. So it's an honor for people for you to write a story about them. And it reminds you of the patients that you loved and enjoyed treating during your years. And then 20 years from now, hopefully you can reread your medical school diary and have a better reaction than I did when I read mine. And so I also recommend writing letters to friends, which of course is easier now, like keeping in touch with people in the outside world with the internet. You don't have to get out your typewriter. But like in these letters, be really vulnerable and really share like that you cried this term or this particular patient made you sad. And it's okay. Like you need to be like a real human and alive. And then see patients as soon as possible. Hopefully you have a curriculum that allows you in your first year to like 
like see at least one patient or do something with a real patient and if you don't you should volunteer at a clinic because that's the thing that gives you energy and joy and that's why you're here is to help people so volunteer at a free clinic if you're not offered like a real patient to work on through your but maybe that's a letter you could write can we please be assigned to a real patient sometime in our first term and then be loving and kind you're each other's family and support for the next four years and so give classmates cards and flowers just for fun like practice um, you know random acts of senseless joy with each other it's just gonna make it so much better for everyone right because like honestly like I really have a commitment here that you all will prevent anyone's parents from getting a phone call from the police during the next four years saying something happened to their child that was your classmate that you didn't know and you wished you would have met before they jumped or before they overdosed so like that's the call to action that I really have is I don't want parents to be getting these phone calls anymore from people who like are super smart and loving and all they want to do is help people. How can we let them end up in this situation? And find mentors. You need somebody to believe in you and your dreams. It's always helpful, even if you just have one person that says, you can do it. She's in my teleseminar now, and I think that's one of the main things I say on the phone. And that makes, she's a pre-med student at U of O, Kayleen. And, um, and so, so the thing is, it's so important to have at least one person that believes in you in medicine, because there's so much cynicism. And I think you understand why there's so much cynicism now. They went through the same training I did. Your superiors had to do things that were unethical. And they're still suffering from it. And then finally, number 10, expect secret admirers. If you do what's right, you will have secret admirers. And you might not figure out who they are for 25 years, but literally, oh my gosh, I just have this thing in the Washington Post. My article ended up in the Washington Post. Who started my writing career? The guy who I was scared of who let me out of the animal labs, who encouraged the newspaper at my school to publish an article about, he even said, her writing career. I never even thought I had a writing career. They offered me $50 for that article. I have a writing career now. Now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is that, um, but uh, I just think if you do what's right, you'll have a lot of secret admirers. And my big dream for all of you is that not only will you have secret admirers, is if you do what's right, you'll, you may even graduate with groupies and a fan club. Better than a rock musician if you do what's right. So that's all I have to say. I think you're standing up for all these people too, right? You're standing up for all the people that are helping us heal. Like their life was not in vain, right? So, so I will take all the questions that you have and I'll stay as long as it takes. And here's another sweet guy who I love, who was lost. Um, I, I talked to these people's parents, you know, and uh, he, he died when he was 29. I went to Kinko's to FedEx to, to photocopy these and laminate them. And the woman behind the desk said, oh wow, are they your kids? And I was like, yeah, I think they are. I'm kind of taking on their life as seriously as their parents. Yeah, they're my kids. They, I've adopted them. And um, yeah, so it's about being a real healer. So please ask me questions and but with the uh, microphones, which are placed in the middle of each row. Hi. Hi. Um, sounds official. I was wondering if you could talk about the format of your clinic, how you've managed to put together a practice that really works for you and your patients. Okay, well, just to let you know, I have a 14-page or so FAQ that's free if you email me off my website. That gives you, like, all the nuts and bolts um, that, that I could include in 14 pages. But how I set it up is I basically just did what my patients wanted, and they wanted small and simple and cozy. So I have, like, a 280-square-foot office and with one exam room, you know, because... 
I can't be in three exam rooms at once and I don't want three naked people waiting for me at the same time. I just think that's unhealthy no matter what your profession is. You should be focusing on one person at a time. Even if you're a hairdresser, even if you're a prostitute, even if you're a doctor, <laughs> please just take on one person at a time. I think that's how life works the best. So, um, so the thing is that cuts down the cost of, you know, like my office space is only, um, like when I started renting it uh, 10 years ago, it was only $280 a month. And now it went up to 370, which is really cheap. I probably pay the least amount of almost any doctor on office space. And I have no staff, so it's like zero on um, having to pay anyone, uh, you know, as an employee. And my malpractice, by the way, is really cheap. Like Oregon is an awesome place to open ideal clinics because this is not a very litigious place. It's not like Miami or Chicago or other places where people are seem to be so happy and uh, juries tend to go against the doctor. Like here, it's like wholesome people who are just really nice that want a really wholesome, nice doctor. So it's a good place to live. And reimbursement is really high. In Oregon, by the way, reimbursement is higher than anywhere else in the lower 48 that I've ever found. The only place that's better is Alaska, which is just some random thing that I don't even understand why it is, but it kind of works out great. So the structure of my clinic is like any other clinic you saw it in the, and uh, you were hopefully here and you saw that. Um, but I see one person at a time. And it's, it's almost like, let's just say, a counseling office. It would look like a counseling office, except I still do surgery and, and you know prescribe medications and take insurance. And the only difference between me and a regular clinic is I don't give vaccines on site just because that's kind of an ordeal and the refrigerator and the temperature and having to, you know, and they could get them anywhere like at a regular pharmacy. But for the most part, I think you would feel like you're at any other clinic except you're with somebody who's more maternal and loving and spends 30 to 60 minutes with you. So you get like, you just don't feel shuffled through. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, and just email me and I can give you the FAQ. Yeah, so. Any other questions? Please ask me anything. Claire, I know you have a question. <laughs> I don't have any questions. <laughs> wow, I've answered every, okay. So even learn. Oh, can you um, just speak in the microphone? So we didn't even, we didn't even learn in our um, behavioral medicine and psychology course about the prevalence of suicide rates in physicians, especially older male physicians, and um, mental illness aside and everything. With that seriousness, what are the steps we can make even as physicians, male and female, no matter what age we are, so that we don't get bogged down by our profession, we don't lose the vision while we're practicing? Um, I definitely uh, agree with something you said earlier, having the social support system, being married and having friends and family and colleagues. What are some other things we can do to safeguard ourselves and those that help us? Okay, so one thing that I really think everyone should be doing, including in your medical education, and I hope somebody will write this letter and get this started in your school, is something called Balant Groups. Have you ever heard of that? It's B as in boy, A-L-I-N-T. And it's basically been around, you can just look it up, there's even a Balant Society. And what it is, is that um, mostly doctors would get together. I experienced this at, at Peace Health Medical Group, which was one of my kind of unfavorite factory jobs, but the doctors were, again, don't wait for their employer to do something for them, do something for yourself. They put together these ballot groups in the family medicine department, so that was optional, that you could come after work and sit, and I think there was a group of five, or five to seven doctors, and they run it like any other case conference sort of thing, like one person will start and say something like, you know, I had a three-year-old uh, patient who came in today with a Wilms tumor, and uh, I started to feel really sad because I lost my um, nephew to this, you know? And so what happens is you start by presenting a case, but without, the purpose is not to figure out the differential diagnosis and to work on the patient. The purpose is to turn it around and talk about your feelings providing care for your patient 
who had this condition, you know, because come on, let's just face it, you're going to see patients who are dying of things that your parents have died or your grandparents have died from, and you're going to feel certain emotions seeing illnesses that are going to remind, you're going to see patients that are going to remind you of family members, and you're going to have a reaction to it, and you can't just, you know, here's the thing that's not normal, it is absolutely not normal to go in and work in the ER and tell a family that, sorry, your three-year-old died in the car accident, and they're shrieking and screaming and then they tell you we'll just go in room 10 now and see Miss Jones because she's having a heart attack and you just go through your whole career sucking all that misery down without any release valve you never go for help you never talk about this you I mean if you talk about any of it you're gonna overburden your family or people who aren't in medicine so I really think like we need to heal each other because we have we can handle a lot of trauma or we wouldn't be in this profession and we need to help each other with like these ballot groups for example it's just a weekly group where you you meet with first year medical students or second year medical students and you form a group of five to seven people and you discuss like, gee, learning about, you know, Nef the renal and the nephrology or this particular disease, it's really hard for me because my mother had that. And just be able to express how you're feeling so it's not bottled up. Like I lead these physician retreats. I had a woman actually come and start crying about a case she had 30 years ago. And she said it was the first time she's cried in years and she was so glad she was even crying. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we, we're just like piling this stuff on day after day, year after year, the traumas that we see, especially because society isn't quite functioning that well right now, so we kind of serve as a social safety net for people, and you are hearing some really bad stories, and then you just think you can take a nap and come back tomorrow and shove it all down again, so I think having ballot groups would be good, which you can initiate at any time, and, um, and then also um, I think just being more human with your patients, like the whole idea of professional closeness instead of professional distance, which I think is harder for men just because um, women are more relational by nature and hugging and the estrogen and the crying, it just happens so easily, you know what I mean? Like I have a transsexual patient on estrogen and he who's now she is just, I said, well, well how do you know you're on the right dose or you know, how are you feeling? He's like, she is so happy, I can cry during movies now, you know, just like, okay. It's it's good, yeah. So, um, so the thing is, you just want to see if you can stay connected. Like when I see patients, I, I try to connect with them, you know, physically, you know, stethoscope on them, touch their hand, do something so they feel like you touched them, right? You didn't just have a conversation. And then emotionally, I try to like connect with them emotionally and spiritually. I ask them, here's something that could help ground an office visit. I always ask people on their intake forms, what's your life purpose and what's your what's your vision for your life or something like that. And and um, and then I write that at the top of their chart. You know, some people say just to live in the light of God or to, you know, love my family or to garden or whatever they say it just really helps because then when you open the chart you're looking at somebody and you're seeing the whole purpose of the visit no matter what their physical ailment is is that he wants to experience God this is his purpose for being on the planet where spiritual beings have a human experience and the other thing I'll say about men is like men generally even have trouble like asking for directions when they're lost in a car so to expect like a guy with a white coat with all that ego and training to ask for like mental health help is really like uh, asking a lot okay so that's why you need to like build this in so that you're not at the end having an arterial bleed you know and jumping you know it's about it's like basically prevention by learning to have a release valve every week for your emotions somehow you know which is not burdensome to your family because you will totally wear out your spouse if you discuss the things that you see at work so a release valve with your colleagues does that help? That's absolutely Yeah, everyone look up balance groups um, online and try to start those wherever you can. And then, by the way, since you guys are ahead of the curve here, like I really do think that the younger generation of doctors is going to be healing the older generation of doctors who didn't quite get as fair of a deal because we weren't as evolved as humans back then because this was pretty barbaric what I had to witness. So anyway, like by you starting these ballot groups and talking about this when you do rotations, you know, you can really help because you can see like some of the people that you do rotations with, they don't look that healthy. 
and you like you don't want them to jump or overdose or gone you know gunshot wound you know and so by starting these balance groups at places where you work it's just super you'd be you'd literally be saving other doctors lives men and women so and you kind of normalize it because you know it's easier to come in and say oh i saw a 33 year old 33 year old woman with abdominal pain than walk into a psychiatrist's office and say oh i think i'm suicidal you know it's much easier to start by talking about the patient and then how you feel yeah because yeah and people don't have that much faith in some of the wellness programs out there and then you worry about the paper trail there's no paper trail with balance groups you know it's just people hanging out together so Sure, you're welcome. Next, anything else? Ask me anything. Yes. Um, can you tell okay. me about this in your book, of course? Um, oh, I can just be loud. So maybe if you could tell a couple specific stories of how you change patients' lives. From the book, you said? Not even from, I, oh. I know it's in your book, uh -huh. but just to say it to us. Oh, a few ways that I've changed. Yeah. She wants me to share a few stories about how I've changed patients' lives. Well, I think just asking that question, what your life purpose is on the intake form, which is like no effort on your part. You just print an extra line that says, you know, after family history and allergies and just put what's your life purpose and what are your health goals? Like just by asking that, you shift the whole relationship to like, wow. Nobody asked me about my dreams. I don't even, do I have a life purpose? Why am I here? You know, and it's just amazing. I spent one entire visit with like a very curious 20 something guy who he just couldn't get off what his life purpose was. And that's what we talked about the entire visit. And he was really thankful and he left still wondering what his life purpose is. And I think that was just more helpful than anything else I did during his physical. So, um, so one woman told me she felt like when she left my office that she had a physical met with a marriage counselor and had a spiritual awakening so it's like total one-stop shopping <laughs> so I think that's what you want like basically if you're practicing medicine well as a healer you feel more invigorated at the end of the visit if you ever feel more tired or like like somebody has drained you then you did not perform the visit correctly because a real medical appointment like both parties feel uplifted afterwards because you had like epiphanies, aha moments, connections, people figured things out about their life at a deeper level. Like that's what healing is, right? And when you actually have a healing experience, even if you're the one just witnessing it, it's like a real rush of positive energy. And so that's how you'll know if your appointments are going well. You know, plus people leave with balloons and they're smiling and they're laughing and, you know. Oh, one thing I did recently, you could check my blog, you guys should all like, be my Facebook friends and look at my blog. And But I, I had a patient come in, oh, this is a friend of mine who, every year she takes me out on my birthday with another friend of mine and the reason why they kind of remember that, and they're sometimes six months late taking me out for my birthday, but they always remember eventually, is because I'm December 5th, so I'm 12-5 and my friend is 5-12, so we have like inverse birthday numbers. So so, you know, we always kind of just click and remember each other, but that our third friend who's 823 doesn't fit in the numer numer numerologic click. <laughs> so it's like, I always forget to celebrate her birthday, but she's always with us when we go out. So she's my patient. And I was like, oh wow, she scheduled her physical on 822. And all year long, I've been trying to remember 823, 823. I don't want to forget Rachel's birthday on the 23rd. And so what I did is I had a surprise birthday party for her in the exam room. I had all her friends like back back there with balloons and presents all over the exam table and she came in it was super funny and he was in there uh, my uh, videographer and photographer it's all on there there's video and everything that we you know she came in and she's like it's so funny because she just thought she was with me right and I knew if she was going to talk about like dry vagina or anything I had to cut her off because it's like I didn't want her to start talking about failed relations or things that like her kids didn't want to listen to in the other room and stuff right so I um you know she came in and it was so funny she's like hey sexy lady and we were hugging and you know you can tell we're you know more than doctor patient we're friends so then I um I said well let's go in the other room and do your physical we went around the corner and she's like oh my god you know it was great they were blowing horns and so I think like it's just really fun to be um playful about what you do you know because that's healing 
laughter is healing. Like you can accomplish, here's what you have to remember. Like you go to doctor's offices and how, how many times are they just kind of like the energy is low, the vibe is low, like the colors aren't so good, the doctors are kind of frowning. It's like, guess what? Even if you're running in an assembly line practice, you can accomplish just as much every day with a party hat on and it only costs 50 cents. You know what I mean? Or a balloon. Like you can go to the dollar store and get helium balloons. You can Just having a balloon in the exam room with a smiley face. You know what I mean? Like anything. I even store like, I go to party supply stores and I look for stuff that I could use on my patients. And you know how like they, I don't know, when you're in exam rooms, they, especially in big clinics, they try to organize all the drawers the same so that you know the KY jellies here, here's the chemical cards here, you know. And so what I do is I always insert like Mardi Gras supplies in there so that everything's mixed up. Like I put party supplies mixed up around the medical supplies so that I remember Remember, this is supposed to be fun, you know? So anyway. <laughs> I mean, you can literally code the same at the visit, build the insurance company, accomplish the same work, smiling with a party atmosphere, and actually probably you'll both leave feeling better. I'm not kidding. It's really easy. So, what else? Yes. So we saw a little clip of one of the people that you helped open her own ideal clinic, the Happy Dogs Clinic. Mm -hmm. um, She's in Salem, actually. In Salem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have there been any others locally recently? Um, um, lo well, there's like like 10 in Eugene or so of these clinics. Not all of them did town hall meetings and the whole style, but they basically, I would say the difference is if you're in a production-driven clinic, you feel one way. If you're in a relationship-driven clinic, you feel another way. And so what I'm encouraging people to do, especially in primary care, is to have relationship-driven clinics because it just makes more sense like the doctor's happy less likely to jump from a roof you know less like it's like it's protective to have relationships with your patients and to feel like you're doing a humane amount of work you should not ever feel like you're in an inhumane situation if you're in an inhumane situation please write a letter about it to somebody who can change that and let them know that this is inhumane and use words like bullying abuse and you know not in any kind of like kind of angry way, but just some people might not even realize that what they said borders on bullying, you know, and that the course load you have or the hours that you're keeping is like abuse. I think like that's new, some because like we've been bred to be self-neglectant and to consider like, you know, I mean, I heard a story of like somebody in residency whose whose partner committed suicide, like their their marital partner committed suicide, and they went right back to work the next day in the ICU and didn't take a breath. You know what I mean? And that's considered like, wow, great work, doc. Like that is not normal. You know, uh, it, it's just we have to like get to be human again and. And, and we need to remind people that inhumane situations are inhumane for everyone, including the patient, and that there's like, it's, it's okay to be normal and human. And really, the reason why all of this is even happening is that I think there is a fatal flaw in reductionist medicine. And we're still being taught the reductionist medical model. Reductionist medicine means that we're machines and so we're like robots. And so you should be able to do your mother's gallbladder surgery in a pinch. And you should be able, you know, there's an anesthesiologist who told me that in his program 20 years ago or 10 years ago, 15, something like that in Michigan, that one of the students in his class class had com committed suicide and they took her body to the anatomy lab and made the first year's dissect her. She was a third year, right? So like, yeah, like whoever decided that, like you would think that's like super sadistic, but like the people who are deciding these things, they think that's good for you. You should be able to in a pinch do the autopsy on your wife if you had to, like who else would do it? You know, you should be able, to, that's ridiculous, right? Like, like, okay, we're human. We hopefully, our hearts are still in our bodies. Our souls are still in our bodies. Like that will protect us from jumping off a building if you still have your soul in your body and you still have all your parts working normally. And But you know, we cannot put people in situations where they have to turn off their humanity because then it gets permanently turned off. And they're not gonna be good as parents and they're not gonna be good as wives or husbands and they're not gonna be any use to their patients and they might wanna die. 
and maybe that has something to do with our high rate of suicide. I don't know. I need a, I would love to do debriefing interviews on these people, but I can't. But maybe you could do a psychological autopsy on yourself sometime. It's kind of fascinating, especially if, when you finish medical school. Just try to figure out like what worked and what didn't work. What feedback can I give so that the next generation of doctors doesn't have to undergo some of the stuff that didn't work for me? because it's a group effort and we have to help each other. And I don't think anyone's really trying to harm us, it's just we're like stuck doing like, what do they say, a tradition's just a bad idea held by a lot of people for a really long time. Like, like don't we wanna switch and do something more evolved at some point? So, more questions, did that answer? I, don't, I even forgot what the question was. What was it? <laughs> Uh, the clinics that had opened recently where you can Oh yeah, yeah, look on the map. And I have like 30 people in my teleseminar now, which basically, you gotta look at the, uh, just click on Physician Retreat on my webpage because it's, it's I have scholarships for medical students and pre-med students to do it. So uh, it's like $1,600 for like doctors to do this 12 week course and the retreat at Brighton Bush. But I have some pre-meds doing it for free. I have other people like, you know, $300 is good. Like that would be, but if, if you wanna do it, it's really cool. We're only on week three and I have all the calls recorded and that means you get to talk to me every Sunday at noon, which I don't know if you want to do that, but if you do, then uh, <laughs> here's your chance. <laughs> and, and, and go to Brighton Bush Hot Springs with me in November, which Claire did. Yeah. What do you think, Claire? Did you tell people about it? Yeah, yeah. it was, it was life-changing, honestly. Somebody hand her something. She has a testimonial. <laughs> Hello. Um, people that know me, um, I, I left school initially, uh, I came back for a lot of reasons, but um, it definitely was life changing. A lot of people that went there were kind of discouraged by the whole medical field in general. And we're really fortunate in the DO profession because a lot of people that come here are really well rounded. Um, so we kind of have, it's a little bit of a different perspective. Um, but from what I've seen, and even doctors that I really respect that have been out there, including a family doctor, I've seen um, how it's taken a toll in their lives. So um, it's really refreshing to see how a bunch of individuals came together, how it changed their lives. Um, just finding the heart through medicine, really. It, that's what I really saw, essentially, is that you you can get lost um, you know, in the paperwork, in you know, the robotic app atmosphere of it, but there is a, a very good way of putting your heart into it. It's, it's very, very doable. And that's why we're, we're here, right? I mean, you can lose sight of that, honestly, and you have to keep reminding yourself why you're doing it. And if you do that and always take care of yourself, you can really change lives. So. Any other questions? I'll stay as long as it takes. Here's my physician suicide diary. Unfortunately, I'm still putting entries in every week. Um, what else can I say that I have up here? You know, another thing that I think is helpful is it's just, you know, it's really scary for people's parents who have their kids in medical school now to see these articles. But like Rhonda said, if she just would have known that medical students had a, after accidents, suicide is the highest, you know, is the next cause of death for, number two cause of death for medical students. Like, that's why it's so important to just have public awareness, at least before we, you know, it, it might take a while to change how we educate people and, and do some things differently, but at least, like, if you even knew that your nephew or niece in medical school or your daughter was at higher risk, like, you would, interact with them in a completely different way during medical school. And so I think that's why it's so important that we just have, at least right now, like public awareness. This is a, like a scary topic, I think, for patients, because it's like nobody wants to hear about death and suicide is not something that anyone really wants to talk about. And the thought that their doctors could be doing this, it's just almost like being Christian and finding out there's no Jesus, you know? I mean, it's just too much. It's too much for somebody to take that like the way they've shaped their world, that they think doctors are, uh, uh, they hold them in a certain, in a certain, uh, you know, perspective, and to find out that we're this injured, it's just hard for even the media to wrap them, themselves around this. Which is why I'm amazed that I even got this one thing out there. It's baby steps. So, yes. So 
So why are you an add-on at six o'clock at night rather than part of the curriculum? Okay. Have you been here before? Yeah, I've been here before. I did this. He wants to know why I'm an add on. Why am I not part of the main curriculum here? Well, I did this before in 2012. And I think the reason it's a very interesting question because, um, you know, I don't have like a whole marketing team. I don't have like a whole, I'm an MD and not a DO. Like, I have encouraged DOs in town who've opened ideal clinics to start teaching here you know but I didn't even know if I was invited I'm not like a DO well, MD. but anyway um, but no really I would be open to teaching I just feel like um, obviously my hands are full with a lot of stuff that I'm doing but it, it's something that if, if somebody asked me to start teaching at a medical school I would love to do it okay it's just I haven't been asked to be like a regular professor or teach you know anywhere so I'm just it's all generated by let's just say the interest of the students most events that I've done it's medical students who've invited me and medical students have generated and the older doctors have been like I don't know I don't have as much interest interaction with them. I have more interaction with the younger generation for some reason. Um, maybe I'm too youthful. I don't know. I'm too playful. I think I might scare some people. You know, honestly, some of this stuff is like uh, hard to talk about. And people who are older, and I even have a woman in my um, in my teleseminar who I have several physicians who are suicidal in my teleseminar. And interestingly, like when a relatively happy pre-med student speaks on the phone later on when I'm talking to to the doctor, they're actually angry at the younger person for being happy and I think it's because they feel like they lost their life dream and by hearing young people just on the verge of living their dreams it kind of just digs it in for some people so I don't know that some doctors are necessarily that happy that I exist and that I'm happy I mean I've had doctors be upset with me for being so happy you know and literally on a listserv that I was on like some people thought I was lying about like how much money I make and lying about how could your office be so cheap and I've and, um, I've actually said an article in it to one um, to the American Family Physicians. I had an article that I sent in, and I've been published in medical journals and, and stuff. But it's just interesting. Sometimes I run into these roadblocks where they, it was peer reviewed. They sent me. They said they didn't want to accept my article about you know ideal medical practices and how you could have it, oh, this low overhead clinic because the reason why is they said it was too utopian in nature. Okay, so like we want to stay miserable. I can't force you guys to be too utopian if you're not ready so I think some of it has to do with I don't know so it's too good to be true they can't believe that I exist I don't know so I'm happy to I'm happy to be a regular part of any maybe that's a letter you can write somebody can write that letter gee why aren't we doing this okay good <laughs> yes first of all thank you for coming uh, your voice is a voice that's needed to be heard for quite a while uh, I love the we just want you to get, because this is going to be on, um, I'm going to put this online, because other medical schools would like to hear this too, and they can't believe I'm only doing this in Lebanon. How did you guys get so lucky? Okay. <laughs> First of all, thanks for coming. Um, your voice is a voice that you've heard for quite a while now. Um, I've been following you for about two years. Um, on well, who are you? You're stalking me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, I'm Jay Hudson. What, what's your name? Right. Jay. Jay, okay. Jay's been stalking me for two years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, I left the software uh, field uh, because I felt that I actually I needed more of a connection with people. And I can't tell you the number of physicians that I spoke to before making my decision to leave the software field that discouraged me from pursuing this path um, and saying that I mean, why would I leave at the height of my earning power? Why would I walk away from that? Well, because it's soulless and empty. And they would tell me that, well, the direction you're heading, that's how we feel. Why would you do that? Because I think there's a difference that can be made. And I think changing the ethic of the environment that we work in, where we, what we're working towards, is how we do that. And I don't think that we can do it 10 minutes at a time. So I'm very interested in the model that you're proposing, where we can sit and we can build relationships. And that's why I've been following. That's why I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I mean, I think what people tend to do is, in, in the United States at least, we start demonizing different things, like, oh, it's all the insurance, oh, I don't like Obamacare, and oh, if it's the pharmaceutical companies, they're just rich and greedy, and really, like, there's nobody to demonize. Look in the mirror. How are you living your life? Are you a victim? If you're a, you cannot be a victim and a healer at the same time. Okay, the problem is our instructors in medical school too often feel vi like victims, and like this is an apprenticeship profession. If you're a victim as an instructor at a medical school, you're creating a whole new generation of victims just by being there. I think we need to figure out who is not well in the teaching profession in medicine and get them the help they need so that they can actually be what a doctor is, which is a real teacher. You cannot teach student. You should not be teaching students if you're cynical and jaded and I get you know students that come to me in my office and they say at the end of the day you know when they shadow with me I ask them you know well you know did this meet your goals or did you get anything out of this and they'll say things like uh, well you're the first happy doctor I've ever met which is a great honor for me, but it really sucks thinking that, like, oh no, wait, you're at a medical school, you're surrounded by doctors all day long, and you haven't met a happy doctor until you came to my office. This is, like, absolutely tragic, and, like, no amount of legislation from Washington, D.C. is going to reverse this, okay, if I'm the only happy doctor you've ever met. And then uh, they'll say things like, and you're the first solo doctor we've ever met. We've been told in medical school that's not possible anymore. Who's teaching medical school? School. Like, do they get out? I mean, the thing is, like, there's solo doctors all over the place, and some of us are, like, really happy, and other ones have recreated the rat race on a small scale, and they're not happy, but they just kind of, we don't have enough mentors. We need, see, I think, like, the people who are really, it should be like, uh, you all are getting a copy of this at the end. I have uh, this handout here, but on the back of the top 10 tips for loving medical school is the a healer's hierarchy of needs. I recreated Maslow's hierarchy of needs to fit what doctors need, right? So we've got on the bottom physiologic. Adequate sleep, bathroom breaks, wholesome meals and snacks, time to exercise, access to clean air and water, comfortable warm clothing, and a sexually fulfilling relationship. I just made this up, but you can add more, right? Then there's safety, right? Safety. <laughs> All right, fulfilling work with freedom from malpractice fears, abuse, freedom from abuse of third parties, freedom from Medicare and Medicaid pay cuts, freedom from threats of fraud investigation, and dishonest employers, a safe workplace, a nurturing environment, affordable health care. Then there's social. Well, feeling like you're an integral part of a community, giving and receiving love and affection, the joy of serving others, time for friendship, family, and intimacy. Then there's the self-esteem, self right? Achieving mastery and recognition and respect as a healer. Serving as a role model of health for patients and for your community. Then there's the self-actualization, which is what I'm going for not only with myself, but everyone I interact with in my entire life, including all my patients. I tell them the whole reason I'm here. I'm just letting you know, I'm not here to put you on the algorithm or see how we do. I mean, I'd like your hemoglobin A1C to be great, but really, I'm just going to tell you my my secret reason for being here is I'm trying to get you to become a self-actualized person. That's my goal for being here in this medical appointment with you. And a self-actualized person is someone who's fulfilling one's life potential. And once you reach that point, then you're in the perfect position to help others do the same. And so I think that's kind of how we need to approach. We should not be in a medical school environment that's not conducive of you getting onto this healer's hierarchy of needs. You should not be, you know, obviously this is a good way to frame things in your life and uh, feel free to add things to it and circulate it around. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, the, the thing is there are doctors who feel trapped in jobs that they can't get out of. They're in survival mode, right? They have no idea that, like, they haven't even really thought about that they're their employer's only competition. They're too busy. That's why they keep you working full time in a lot of these big offices. I even talked to the CEO at Oregon Medical Group once. I said, you know, why don't you let your doctors work part time? I think, you know, you get a lot more out of them for the time than they're there if they actually got time to spend with their kids and go to baseball games and do stuff that regular people do. And they're like, no, we're not interested in that. They don't want part time 
employees. Why? They don't want you to have any time for self-reflection so you can realize you don't belong there. They want you to be in survival mode. And like, honestly, you know, it's like you're in paper chains. Like the minute you realize that you don't have to be there, you can slip right out and go across the street and get an office like I have for $370 if you're in primary care, something pretty inexpensive, Oregon, come on, you know, and then you can do like magic. Like you can just be the doctor you always wanted. And so, uh, I mean, one of the large multi-specialty groups in my town lost 18 primary care doctors in one year. Now, I don't think any of them opened their own clinic. What they did is they jumped into another dungeon somewhere else thinking that it might be better in the paper chains at this other place. And then because they saw this, you know how many slick ads I get in my mailbox promising me $300,000 a year and no call if I go here, there. And it's like, I wouldn't trade in what I have for like $5 billion a year. Like I actually have a great, I feel like I'm retired and I'm working, you know? I could make more money working this way if money were my goal. That's what people ask me sometimes. Well, you know, they just assume you must be a hippie on a hill, you know? How do you, you just don't care about money. Well, that's not true. That can make more money working this way. Then I, on the FAQ that I'll send out if you want it, you can email me, I'll send it to you. Um, but you know, there's doctors who are practicing, who opened ideal medical clinics who are defaulting on their student loans. And there's doctors who opened ideal medical clinics who are making like over $300,000 a year. What's the difference? Well, one's interested in making $300,000 a year and one doesn't really care about money. They're in the same you know, building with me. So the thing is, um, you can have whatever you want, which is why it's so important for you to figure out what your dream is your dream might have nothing to do with money like after paying off your loans you just might want to be free and do whatever you want you know and live like a voluntary simplicity lifestyle or you might want to like rake it in you can do that ethically if you set your um, clinic up properly and you want to work more of a full-time schedule in an ideal medical clinic I mean you could make far more than any other family practice doctor in the country if you wanted to do that so because some people think, oh, well, I'll do that after I pay off my student loans or let me put my life on hold again for another five or 10 years and maybe later I'll do something that I really want to do. Oh, when I retire, I could finally go to Hawaii or whatever. I mean, people like, put, you should be able to have fun now. You know the Zen poet quote? I love that quote. I don't think I have it in the book, but a person who is a master in the art of living makes little distinction between their work and their play, their labor and their leisure, their mind and their body, their education and their recreation. They simply pursue everything they do with excellence and grace and leave others to decide whether they are working or playing. To them, they are always doing both. That is what I want you to have, which you can have at any time you decide. Questions? Yes. Uh, so what is your weekly schedule like? Do you kind of uh, structure your schedule around what you're wanting to do in your life, or do you have more of like a nine to five kind of schedule? Oh no, I'm not an, I am not a nine to five person. <laughs> um, my my what I call my full time part time schedule. Like if I really max out my part time schedule, I see eight patients a day, three half days a week, and I work starting at two to three in the afternoon because I like to sleep in. I haven't set an alarm clock in ten years for work, and I really like that. It's just it feels better after all those loud noises and the things that wake you up in the middle of the night in medical school, and you know it's just. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really great. And so I would ride, before I developed a little bit of a knee issue, I would ride my bike to work. I would um, I'd give my patients gifts and their bikes would be for riding their bikes to work. And I'd see them all with their bike helmets on and we all kind of like rode together. Like I used to like get up in the morning uh, when I was first starting and go to this coffee shop down the street and sit there and do all my patient charts and kind of, oh, this is really funny. I'd get, because I know my patients really well and I schedule them for the amount of time that they need like they don't do online scheduling um, 
I mean, I schedule them through email, but it's not like they schedule themselves. So I kind of know who's coming in and because I've talked to them or gotten their email, like I know what they're coming in for. So sometimes this is super funny. I did this as an experiment because I know my patients so well. I would put all their charts out and get ready for the day and I would start writing their chart note before they even came in and just to see if I was like on track with what I thought was going on. And I would like even put their diagnosis because, and I was like literally, when I'd see them, I was already done with their chart note before they came in almost because that's how well I know my patients, you know? And uh, I mean, of course I would add to it and stuff, but it was like, there's no surprises and no like, oh, by the way, I have chest pain. You know what I mean? When you have 30 to 60 minutes, like everything's out in the open at the beginning and you can tell if they're hiding something or if they start crying, you can dive into other areas that they didn't want to discuss, you know? So does that, yeah. That's great. Yeah. How many patients do you have total? I have about 500 patients. But I mean, if I was working kind of a full, a full schedule, like I'm sure I could, if I worked more of like a four full days a week, I could probably take care of like 1,500 patients well um, and see, you know, like eight to 10 a day or something like that. It, it's just, it's just um, people who select to come to you when you're in an office like this, which is functional and really healing, are people who really want to get better. You should try like sitting in different waiting rooms of clinics around town. And you'll notice some places have a really low energy and like high misery level and people don't seem to be getting better there. They just keep coming back for 10 minute visits. And it's like basically a patient will fall to the level of dysfunction within a clinic. So it's, if it's full of doctors who feel trapped, miserable, and are thinking of suicide, like the patients are not really going to be getting that well there. And it's just going to be... Um, it, it, you're gonna you're gonna have a patient load that's bigger and needier and more annoying okay from your perspective so a lot of people can't believe I could be on call 24 7 and enjoying that because like wouldn't your patients drive you nuts you don't want these people calling you all hours of the day but actually there's a a, a, um, a situation called tragedy of the commons have you ever heard of that that's where when patients or when people in general feel that a resource is scarce they hoard it so if physicians have a human shield of like 10 employees protecting them from ever having to really talk too long to a patient and they have these phone trees and all this stuff that they make that are barriers for like an accessible relationship then you will feel like there are hordes of people that are like grabbing and needy and you'll never feel like you can get away and your patients will get on your nerves and but it's like you created that monster you created that monster it's like your kids would probably act out be doing drugs and be getting in a lot of trouble if you had if you are not accessible to them if you're accessible to to your partner and your kids like you have a normal relationship and people like get along well and they're not needy and annoying I don't know did that help okay Anything else? Yes? And if you have to go, I understand here. It's, it's okay. You don't have to stay here all night, although I'm going to stay as long as it takes. But take one of these on your way out if you have to leave. Okay, yes. If you... You're welcome. And please, like, share these with people who weren't here, maybe. Okay. Just a hug. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That quote written down somewhere. Um, I, I can get it. It's not in here. That quote yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, I love that. It's is it? It might, it's not. It's in the workbook. Oh. It's in my workbook. You should join my teleseminar. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. A yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, but I only do shadow like for one afternoon. I don't do like whole months. Oh, because, yeah, 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 yeah. But you should come. Yeah, okay. you can check it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you can shadow with me and hang out and whatever. Come to town. Okay. Questions? Okay, um, my name is Whitney Stewart. I'm a first year student, and um, I mean, I definitely don't know for sure what specialty I want to go into since I'm so early on in this program, but I am really interested in surgery. And I have this crazy dream that I could do a practice similar to what you're doing, but as a surgeon. And so I'm wondering if you have had any um, 
any surgical yes you can do that yeah you can in my teleseminar now I have a dermatologist who's a Mohs surgeon who's going to open she just quit her job and she's going to open her own practice in Houston I know um, I don't know other like surgeons that are doing this but I know orthopedists who have their own practice and yeah they make like maybe 20% less than working in the big group but they're like the coolest doctor in town and everyone can come by and get an x-ray anytime and they're like super like Marcus Welby family practice type small town you know um, orthopedist and they love this guy loves it like I, and there's pediatric ear nose and throat doctors who do it and obviously psychiatrists can do this really easily because what do you need for psychiatry you don't even need a stethoscope so um, you know it's uh it's very accessible to specialists if you if you want to if you want to set up your life this way anything else okay i guess i answered everyone's questions so take a hand out <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Where is your clinic? It's in South Eugene.